Good evening. It's been a wonderful day. Beautiful day. It's supposed to have been a little more rain today. Thankful for what we got and thankful for our worship this morning and the opportunity to join together in study this evening. By way of our lesson tonight, I'm going to do another what I call a hymn sermon rather than a her sermon. No, I'm just kidding. A hymn, hymn sermon. And we're going to use the song, Oh, to be like thee. I am going to concentrate my comments. Uh, incidentally, if you want to look it up, this song is number 602 in our book. You don't have to. We're not going to uh, read through the words very much. But this song is a great song. It's in our book, 602. And the meaning of it uh, is wonderful. Of course, uh, we're going to focus on the first verse because this was part of a summer series I was involved in and a Wednesday night summer series at another congregation and they gave me the first verse. So uh, that's what the, the lesson uh, it consists of. Oh, to be like thee. This song was written by a man named Thomas O. Chisholm. He lived in the... Uh, uh, 18 and 1900s, was born in 1866, died in 1960, and wrote this song in 1897. So this is, we've had this one a while, over 120, uh, 125 years, I guess, and it's a, it's a great song, it's a great thought of being like Jesus Christ. Uh, Mr. Chisholm was a serious Bible student, and in the information that I could find about him biographically, uh, one of the things it said is that he liked to very much concentrate on serious scriptural and biblical themes, this, of course, being one of those. The idea of the song is the Christian's desire to be like the image of Jesus, and in the chorus of the song, it says, Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. A couple of other songs that he wrote uh, were Bring Christ Your Broken Life, one that we still use very frequently as an invitation song, and probably the crowning achievement, I guess, of his repertoire would be Great Is Thy Faithfulness, and I think most of us are familiar with that conventional, traditional uh, hymn. So, O oh, to be like thee, and as I said, we're going to focus on the first verse of this song this evening, and the song starts out, Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer. Blessed Redeemer. What about that idea of Jesus Christ as our Redeemer? Well, as I was looking at this, I did a word study of Redeemer and redemption in the Bible, and it was a very interesting study. And, of course, looking at that, the usage of that word in the whole Bible... And the references therein concentrated first uh, in the Bible chronologically, if you will, in the Old Testament. And there are numerous references in the Old Testament to Redeemer. And this is a recognition of one of the purposes of Christ, the, the, the sole, not the sole purpose, but the predominant purpose of him uh, would be to come and redeem mankind from their sins. And it was interesting to me that in the Old Testament, before the time of Christ, of course, not every case, but in many cases, most cases, Jesus, whether it was prophetic or otherwise, the, the Christ, he hadn't been named Jesus yet, was referred to as the Redeemer or the one who will be the Redeemer. Uh, not in the past tense, but sort of in the present tense or future tense tense of the idea of that word. Some, some examples of that. Job verse 19, 25, where Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. Very much a forward-looking uh, end to that idea. Psalm 19, verse 14, where the psalmist says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I've always loved this verse and thought that it was a beautiful prayer that we can offer 
personally or even corporately with regard to our lives or regards to our worship. Let the words of our mouths or the meditations of our heart be acceptable. But the second part of that, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, the one who is or will redeem me. And then Isaiah 59, verse 20, the redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. Uh, kind of a snippet of a larger verse there, but you get the idea of this Redeemer who is to come in the Old Testament. Of course, what is redemption? Uh, we know the idea behind that is the idea of being bought back. And let's look now at the New Testament. Sorry, I forgot to put the references up there. Uh, if you're taking notes, um, I'll give it to you afterwards. No, there they are. Uh, so, what about in the New Testament? A little different take on the word as it's used. Of course, a lot has changed by the time we read uh, many of these words uh, as they were written in the time of the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Bible speaks of God's people being redeemed. Looking at that in the past tense. If you would, go ahead and turn. We're going to spend a few minutes in the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, with this idea of uh, God's redeeming his people and having redeemed his people. Uh, and while you're turning there, the idea in the Old Testament, he was the redeemer, but the redeemer was to come, right? It hadn't come yet, so hundreds or thousands, uh, uh, as the case may be, ye of years would pass until Jesus was there. In the New Testament, he is looked at, either prophetically in the short term as the redeemer or one who has redeemed mankind from their sins. You remember the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, as we refer to him, Mary and Elizabeth were, were kin to each other and Elizabeth was going to have a baby and that baby uh, is going to be the one who is to prepare the way for Jesus the Christ. And Gabriel comes to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, in chapter 1, uh, verse 18 or so. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? How, how, how am I going to really know that this is going to happen? For I am advanced in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. And you want a sign? Uh, Zacharias took him a little bit of convincing. Gabriel says, uh, you will be mute and not able to speak until the, days, until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So now Elizabeth, Zacharias' wife, is going to uh, have a baby. She's going to be with child. Zacharias, who was a uh, local priest there, is mute and cannot speak during the time of his wife uh, getting ready to have uh, this baby. So if you turn over to, uh, if you have to turn in your Bible, several verses later, around uh, verse 57, it says, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. And if any, any ladies in here, if you've, uh, many of you have had children, did anybody ever ask you about or suggest what you should name your child? Yeah, everybody's like, yeah, plenty of time. Well, that's what happens to Elizabeth here. Uh, she says, because they were told this, that the child, verse 60, uh, is going to be called John. Well, guess, I, I can't believe this would ever happen, but there were some people who didn't think that was the right decision. There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father, remember, because Zacharias could not, he could not talk at this point. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. I love this. He says, you know what, we appreciate he didn't write this, but if he could have said, he might say, you know what, we appreciate all those suggestions, but we're going to name him John, which I think is a great idea. It's a pretty good name. But that was what God wanted, and that was what they wanted, and he kind of put an end to it. Well, it's interesting. When he wrote that down and showed it to them, then he could talk again. Verse 63 
Uh, he asked for a writing ta tablet, wrote his name as John. They all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loose and he spoke. And when he spoke, and this is what we're getting to. Remember, we're talking about the Redeemer. John the Baptist was born before Jesus, so Jesus was not born yet. Zacharias, verse 67, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. So this redeemer that would come as we find it in the Old Testament. Now Zacharias in the very short term is prophesying, uh, talking about something in the future, but talking about it in the, the past tense where he says uh, he has visited and redeemed his people. And they were all part of this process because we know John the Baptist was born. He was to prepare the way for Jesus the Christ. Uh, Zechariah's prophecy here in uh, Luke 1, verse 67. Another uh, representation of this, and of course this is Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, which we know chronologically in the Bible would be after the time that Jesus had already come to the earth, died, been resurrected, and the church had started, and Jesus was again with his Father in heaven. Galatians 3 Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us, past tense, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ has redeemed us. Now, after the time that Jesus had come to earth, we have been bought back. Uh, another Example of this, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Peter says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So that tells us, we, we know that the, the, the idea of redemption is being bought back. There has been a price paid for us so that we could have the opportunity for eternal salvation. We're talking about, oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer. I think it's important that we stipulate and understand, uh, if we're talking about the lyrics to this song, what exactly that means. Now, we can't be like Jesus in that we can't buy anyone back from their sins. But he cared enough about our redemption to do what he did, and we should care enough about ourselves to put ourselves in the right relationship with him and care enough about our uh, fellow humans that we would do everything we can so that they can have redemption as well. A quick illustration about this idea of redemption uh, comes from a book called Wake Up Calls written by a man named Ron Hutchcraft. Uh, this book was written back in 1990. I found this illustration it says, a gathering of friends at an English estate nearly turned to tragedy when one of the children strayed into deep water. The gardener heard the cries for help and plunged in, rescuing the drowning child. That youngster's name was Winston Churchill. His grateful parents asked the gardener what they could do to reward him. He hesitated, but then said, I wish my son could go to college someday and become a doctor. And the Churchills said, we will see to it. And doesn't say this in the, the, the book that I was reading, but it, it certainly insinuates that they followed through with that and they helped this gardener who had saved their son, they helped his son go to college. Years later, when Winston Churchill was the prime minister of England, he was stricken with pneumonia. The country's best physician was summoned his name was Dr. Alexander Fleming, also the man who discovered and developed penicillin. He was also the son of the gardener who saved Winston Churchill from drowning. Later, Churchill remarked, rarely has one man owed his life twice 
to the same person. His life was bought back twice, seemingly, by this gardener. And his parents, of course, were grateful for that. We are bought back by our Redeemer, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. What a great goal for us to have in our lives and especially in our prayer lives to pray to be like Jesus, to pray to be like Jesus. But I want to think about and talk about what exactly does that look like. If we want to constantly have a desire to be Christ-like, I can think of no better uh, place in the Bible to go than to Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. If you want to turn there for just a moment, uh, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, because this great passage of scriptures scripture encapsulates the wonderful story of the gospel so succinctly in just a few verses so if you want to be like Jesus this is a good place to turn and if you want to be like Jesus there are really three areas that you can look at that are a great place to start hebrew or excuse me philippians chapter 2 Verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. And especially, specifically with regard to humility here, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you not look out only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, this chapter, we know the chapter breaks, came later, uh, begins with the word therefore, which leads us to look at what is Paul talking about in the preceding verses. And if you look back into part of chapter 1, Verse 12, Paul says, I want each of you, brethren, to know that the things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. He is referring to the fact that he's in prison when he writes this letter. Paul was in a Roman prison writing this letter to the church at Philippi. And he says, you know what? Paraphrasing, of course. Not not fun to be in prison, but you know what? The fact that I am has made it that the gospel can be furthered. So Paul himself was a great example of humility, and he's writing about that here to the the Christians at Philippi. Toward the end of chapter 1, he is writing about how they can live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, that their conduct is important. Uh, And then he says, you know, taking all those things into mind, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, do these things. And one of those is to offer this attitude of humility look at others as better than yourself he doesn't say completely ignore your own needs he says look up look at your own interests but then look to the interests of others as well and here's the illustration that Paul uses to give us a great example of humility he uses Jesus the Christ he says verse 5 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus if we would paraphrase that There's a lot of ways you can do that. In other words, think the way that Jesus did. Have the attitude about others that Jesus had. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did he do? Well, uh, being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's a, a little bit of a strange usage of words, but the idea that Paul is going for here is that being his equality with God up in heaven was something that Jesus possessed. He did not consider that the most valuable thing to hold on to if it meant that we would not have the opportunity for eternal salvation. Uh, Another translation says he did not consider equality God a thing to be grasped or held on to. But, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he 
humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So in really you see these three ideas in, in the whole scripture, but verses one through four, Paul tells us how to be humble, how to, how to, how to love each other with humility. Verses five, and six, and seven, we see about, we learn about sacrifice, that Jesus left heaven, sacrificed that, gave it up, left heaven and came to earth, lived what was, in, in human terms, not a, not a luxurious existence at all, had nowhere to lay his head. He was reproached and rejected by his own people, betrayed, uh, and eventually hung on a cross and killed. But he was willing to do that. He was sacrificial enough to do that if it meant that we could have our redemption. And then obedience, humbling himself, being obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And if you read the next two verses, you see that he was rewarded for this. God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. That every, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. So, oh, to be like thee, this is my constant longing and prayer. And I think that's a, a wonderful goal and an excellent prayer to pray, to be like Jesus. Well, here's three things that we can visualize and put to work in our lives if we want to, if we want to look like Jesus. Humility, sacrifice, and obedience. That's a great uh, be like Jesus workout for our lives uh, if we want to have that as our constant longing and prayer. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Uh, for this, we want to turn to Matthew and spend a little time in that book for, for a while. Matthew, specifically chapter 6, verse 19. Matthew 6, verse 19. Uh, where Jesus, preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And one of the most telling and profound, even though it's a short one, verses in the Bible Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Does that mean, and is the song telling us, that we can't have anything of value while we're alive in the world if we're going to follow Christ? And the answer, I, I would say, is no. It's not telling us that. But... Would, be, would we have anything in our life that is of more value to us than serving and following Jesus? Even further to that thought, is there anything in my life that I love so much that I, and, and it's something that could keep me from serving and following Christ, from being like him? And if that is the case, then I need to get rid of that thing. I need to be willing to give that up. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look at your life. Another way to put this, look at the things that are valuable to me and valuable to you and kind of draw a circle, uh, two circles, and maybe concentric or, or crossing over one another. And if it's valuable to me and it can fit in the valuable circle and then there's the serving God circle, does, does that valuable thing fit in both of those circles or does it just fit in the one of value? And if it's outside of the circle of serving God, then it's something that I need to get rid of. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 19, and we're familiar with this, but I think it bears exploring uh, for a moment. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 21. The story that we refer to as the rich young ruler. I'm sorry, beginning in verse 16. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, 
what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's a pretty good question, and one that needs to be asked. So he, Jesus, said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And, he, and here's where it kind of goes off the rails a little bit. The young man says, which ones? Well, the answer is all of them, but Jesus gives him a sampling of the Ten Commandments here, and he says, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the young man, pretty satisfied with himself here, because he says, you know what? All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Another really good question. And then Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And we know the sad truth of chapter 19, verse 22. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. I, I think the main idea or thing that we can glean from this story is that Jesus knows our hearts. And Jesus knew this young man's heart, and he knew that his wealth was the one thing that was going to keep him from serving God truly and following after Christ. It would have stand, stood in his way. And we hope that he thought about that and changed his mind and took that barrier away. And I think it's important for us to think, what is it that might be valuable enough to us to keep us from truly serving God the way we should because there is nothing that is more valuable than the righteousness we gain through Christ. Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 and 9. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Again, this is Jesus speaking. It is better for you to enter into life maimed, lame or maimed, rather than having two hands and feet and to be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into eternal life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. What Jesus is doing for us here, he does not want us to physically uh, mutilate ourselves. But he's using a, a kind of a shocking, stark example to help us understand that this is about the long, long term. That we are living a life that is part of eternity. And if there's something in this life that is keeping us from spiritual life in the eternal realm and causing us at some point to have spiritual death, we need to get rid of that thing, whatever it is in our life. If there's something holding us back from the righteousness that can be found through Christ, we need to put that out of our lives because it is not worth it when you think of things in eternal terms. Does your earthly wealth, your comfort, or any other thing stand in the way of your service to God? Well, we need to forfeit those things uh, if it would seek to keep us from serving him. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. And Jesus was perfect. He was the perfect human, lived a sinless life while on this, this earth. He was able to do that, even though he was as human as any of us, as all of us. He was also divine, which is kind of hard to put your mind around, but he had every, he had every instinct, every urge, every difficulty that all of us have with regard to the possibility of committing sin, yet he was sinless. 1 Peter 2, verse 22, who sa says, he who was sinless or had not had no guile in his mouth. The verse that precedes that, 1 Peter 2.21, says, uh, For even hereunto were you called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He who did no sin, nor was any guile found in his mouth. Now, can, can I live a sinless life? Nope, too late. Already sinned. Uh, as has all of us who are of an accountable age. But we can wear the perfection of Jesus if we take part in his perfectness. Uh, let's explore that just a little bit more. Hebrews 10 verses 11 
to 14. Hebrews 10 verses 11 to 14 speaks to this. And every priest, talking about the old system of the old law, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, capital M, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever, listen to this, perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So if we take part in this perfection of Jesus Christ by obeying his commands, obeying the gospel, then we are being sanctified. We are being, as we live, sanctified, set apart for eternity, for eternal salvation. Another uh, verse that talks about how this works is 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, very familiar passage of Scripture and very comforting passage of Scripture for us when we think about having, taking advantage of the perfection of Christ. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if I say, yes, I, I am in fellowship with Jesus, and then I, I leave that conversation and I walk in a, a life of sin and darkness, then I, I am a liar and I'm not practicing the truth. But, thankfully, there's a but here. If we walk in the light as he, Jesus Christ, is in the light, we do have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, listen to the tense here, cleanses an active, continual cleansing us from all sin. Well, how does that work? Well, we do have to recognize and have remorse for and repent of that sin as it comes into our life. But that blood of Jesus Christ is not a one-time thing. It is a sh continuous shower, a fountain flowing, if you will, that cleanses us continually from our sin as we repent of it. And this is our opportunity to take advantage and part in the perfection of Jesus and wear that perfect likeness. In the few moments that we have left this evening, I wanted to look at a quick list here. A constant, if it's a constant longing and prayer to be like Jesus, let's think about some characteristics that he had that we can emulate as well. Number one, Jesus knew the scriptures. We have the wonderful story of his life when he was born in Bethlehem, there's the family flees, they end up in Egypt, eventually back to Nazareth, and then there's a bit of a gap. We don't know a lot about Jesus in his years as a toddler, except for that Mary, uh, you know, kept these things in her heart and had to have been a wonderful mother. But then we are reintroduced to him in Jerusalem at age 12 when he is doing what? Reasoning with the, 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 the Jewish leaders in the temple and talking with them. And then we can fast forward to the, the time right before his baptism when he is tempted in the desert by Satan. And there again, he is actively showing his knowledge of the scriptures. In fact, fending off those temptation attacks by Satan every time by saying, it is written, it is written. Jesus knew the scriptures. He also followed the law of God Sometimes I, I even forget to think about the fact that Jesus was a Jew. He was a Jew that grew up in a Jewish household. And under Jewish law, if you didn't follow Jewish law, that was considered and was transgression of God's law. Therefore, for a man to live a sinless life, he had to have followed the law of God and never broken it. Now, he from time to time was accused of breaking it, but it was by people who were bending the law to their own purposes adding to or taking away from it. For instance, the, the, the case of uh, Jesus healing someone, supposedly healing someone on the Sabbath and that being work. Chad preached about that a few weeks ago very effectively. It's not work to do something nice for someone. We understand God meant for us to have a day of rest, for the Jews to have a day of rest. 
And they, would, they bent that to their own purposes to try and accuse Jesus and hold him accountable for something that he had not done. But he followed the law of God, and it's a different, a new law for us. And if we want to be like Jesus, we need to follow his law. He taught others. So many instances of him teaching and preaching and teaching and mentoring those that he would leave behind to do his work after he was gone. He helped others all the time, going about doing good, whether it was healing or teaching or encouraging. Jesus was about helping other people. He stood up against wrong, and that is something that we have limitless opportunities to do in this day and time. He led by example, and if there's something that I think is very important in our society today, we need good examples to follow. And Jesus was willing to do that. He never, and the picture at the beginning of the lesson of him washing his disciples' feet is a, perhaps the paramount example of Jesus setting the good example of not being so important that he couldn't be down on his knees with a towel washing the feet of those that followed him. He led by example. He led with servant leadership. He associated with sinners and Sometimes we, we have to remember that, you know, he came to seek and save the lost. You can't save the lost if you don't know any people who are lost. Now, that is not to say that we should put ourselves in bad situations where we might be influenced rather than doing the influencing, but we certainly can't save the lost if we don't come in contact with them. And, of course, finally, he died for us all. And as we mentioned we, we, our, our death can't save anyone from their sins, but we can certainly spread the news of Jesus and what he did and help someone be saved. And to do that would be very much to be like Jesus. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. The chorus of that song says... O oh, to be like thee, O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Does your heart have the image of Christ? Is that something uh, that's impossible because you haven't come to know him, to put him on in baptism and to walk in newness of life, having taken part in his death, burial, and resurrection? Maybe uh, you need to make a change to be more like Jesus Maybe you've strayed away from that. Regardless of what your need is this evening, there is help, and it is to be found in Christ and here in this building, if you'll make that known as we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>